Welcome to your next YouTube lecture. We're going to be covering a lot of information today, especially about um, religion in the Bronze Age. And you should have two different sets of guided notes in front of you. Um, one is going to cover mainly Hinduism, and the other is just um, a little graphic organizer that um, we'd like you to take some notes on um, about the Chinese philosophies. Um, that we're going to be talking about today. It looks like uh, this sheet right here. So you should have two different things to take notes on. And um, we'll try to move as quickly as we can, but um, there is a lot of material. So try to stick uh, stick with it and, you know, pause and go back if you miss uh, any of the important information. All right, um, let's just go ahead and start with Hinduism. Hinduism is a pretty complex religion mostly because it is a wide variety of um, practices and rituals and beliefs that we've sort of superimposed a, um, a structure onto, and we call that structure Hinduism, um, although in many ways it's different than a lot of uh, the other religions that we'll study this year. Um, one of its um, one of its most interesting facets is that it doesn't really have a founder. It just kind of grows up a bit organically in South Asia um, as different groups migrate from Central Asia into South Asia, bringing with them their beliefs and practices. And um, we call the people who migrated into South Asia Aryans, and uh, these are not sort of the um, sort of stereotype Aryans that you think about when you think about World War II or something like that. That's just a, a misnomer. It's just a fake thing. Uh, Aryans are a real people group, but they're from Central Asia, and they moved into um, India beginning around 1700 to 1500 uh, BCE. And they were nomadic pastoralists who were pretty warlike based on the text, and they had a series of oral traditions and stories that they told about the origins of the universe and their social hierarchy. And all of these got passed down orally through the years until finally they were written down in a book that we call the Vedas. And the Vedas is the primary book um, for, for most Hindus, uh, and there are later texts that are also... Um, added on to the original book of the Vedas, and that set of books makes up Hinduism's um, holy scriptures. And the Vedas is uh, all kinds of different literature. There's uh, poetry and uh, stories and various rituals and um, uh, different words that are supposed to be spoken. And the Vedas as a book is really primarily written for a group that is called the Brahmins. And Brahmins in Hinduism are a very, very important class of people. Their job is um, to be priests. And that role is really passed down father to son uh, in the Hindu social hierarchy. So if your dad is a priest, you'd become a priest. And the goal of the Brahmin uh, as a class is to correctly perform rituals. And if these rituals are correctly performed, then the cosmos kind of stays in balance and in order. And if they're incorrectly performed, then the whole cosmos can go askew. So you can imagine, um, if that is the belief, um, how important this class of people would, um, would be to, um, to people who are migrating into South Asia during this time period. Um, even though Hinduism has a lot of different practices and people um, who are Hindus might worship uh, different gods from other Hindus, there is a lot of consensus about the Vedas as a book. Um, pretty much everybody agrees on it as um, the primary text of Hinduism. So there's some common ground within Hinduism, even in this huge plethora of um, different practices and beliefs and gods to worship. Um, Strayer, your textbook, talks a lot about um, the development of Hinduism slowly over a period of really about a thousand years in South Asia. 
Um, the early books um, within the Vedas, especially the Rig Veda, a uh, portion of which we read in class that talked about uh, Indra, the thunder wielder. Um, those early books um, are a lot different than the later books. The early books discuss the gods in a very impersonal way. They're very concerned with ritual, and um, they're not very concerned with some of the big questions in life, like, uh, why am I here? What am I supposed to do with my life? How can I be a good person? What is the point of human existence? So later Hindu texts, according to Schreier, kind of begin to pick up these more philosophical threads. Those early books, like the Rig Veda, um, are really just concerned with uh, telling the story about how humans came into existence. The later books are really concerned with saying, you know, what the point of human life is. So there's a lot of difference between those two things. Now, Strayer sort of uh, poses the um, idea that perhaps the religion changed over time as people grew dissatisfied with that kind of standoffish religion that is proposed in the early books of the Vedas, um, where mostly the Brahmins have a big role as priests and other people don't really have very much that they're supposed to do or think about in terms of the religion. So it's easy to see how over time um, a religion based on special rituals and sacrifices done only by one class of people would broaden and widen out to a more um, thoughtful religion where people begin to think about what the point of life was. And we see that in um, later books, especially in the Upanishads. And the College Board's curriculum specifically wants students to understand that evolution over time of the um, religion of Hinduism. And they want you to understand uh, the difference between the Vedas and its books that are dealing with ritual and the Upanishads, which are dealing with a lot more philosophical ideas about why humans are here and how to live a good life. So both of those books, um, you need to make sure that you understand and know, and you need to understand the difference between the two and how Hinduism slowly develops over time as people become dissatisfied with um, really not having a major role in religion if they're not a Brahmin. Um, okay, let's talk about major beliefs of Hinduism. This is pretty basic, not pretty basic, it's extremely basic, but I think it gives you at least a decent framework for understanding how Hinduism works. Hinduism is an interesting religion because although um, it's mostly thought of as polytheistic, I think in many ways you can also think of it as monotheistic because of the idea of Brahman. Brahman is not the same as the Brahmin priests, okay? There's a A rather than an I there at the end. I'll go back so you can kind of see it. Uh, there we go. All right. Brahmin is a universal spirit. It, for all intents and purposes, is the same as the concept of God in most other monotheistic religions. Um, but in Hinduism, um, God is a little bit different because the concept of God is one of a pantheistic God. And I know that might be a little bit of a funny vocabulary word, but all it means is that every one and everything within the universe is all connected back to that one universal spirit or God. So instead of, um, you know, the soul of me or you being separate from God and a different entity, what happens in Hinduism is that all of those souls are actually connected. And sometimes you hear about, um, I don't know, you go to like a family reunion and you really look like your dad and somebody says, oh, you're a chip off the old block. Uh, that's a perfect way to think about um, how Hinduism conceives of the soul in relation to Brahman. It's like a chip off the old Brahman, right? Um, everybody is a small piece of Brahman. So that being said, in Hinduism, there's not just one god. There are a huge, huge variety of gods, almost um, almost an infinite variety of gods, because Brahman, although there is just one universal soul, can take a zillion different forms. 
And in fact, in Hinduism, Brahman does take a zillion different forms. There are a couple major ones that we'll talk about in just a second, but um, incarnations of this divine spirit are not limited. And um, it's one of the reasons that Hinduism has been able to sort of be a unifying force in India because it's able to assimilate new ideas, new practices, and new gods really at the drop of a hat because gods aren't viewed as, um, you know, in opposition to one another. They're simply viewed as being all part of that one universal spirit or universal god and not just all the gods, all of the people as well. Now, the goal of Hinduism is a little bit different than in many religions. Um, the goal in Hinduism is for your soul to merge back with the universal soul, Brahman. And the achievement of that goal is called moksha. So when your soul is reunited with Brahman, when your little chip goes back to the old Brahman, that means that you've achieved a term called moksha. Um, in English, you could um, use the vocabulary word liberation to describe moksha. It's when your soul is liberated from the process of reincarnation. That's what you're actually liberated from. Because in Hinduism, I mean, that's, it might be a funny concept um, because, you know, life is pretty cool. But um, in Hinduism, the goal is to get out of this continuous cycle of constant rebirth into a new body. Um, through this uh, process of um, your soul learning in each uh, lifetime that you have and your soul gaining new knowledge, becoming less selfish, uh, fulfilling your duties and your various social roles that you're supposed to have. And as your soul does these things um, through each reincarnation that you have, it kind of, your soul gets a little bit better and a little bit better. And finally, after a bunch of reincarnations, you can go back and rejoin Brahman. And I think that this is viewed as a good thing because your soul is finally at rest. It's achieved its ultimate goal, which is that being united with Brahman, um, fully understanding its interconnectedness with the rest of the universe. Uh, it's kind of, you know, pretty philosophical stuff. But that's sort of the, the goal over time is for your soul to be reunited with Brahman. So... That's the um, idea of God, and that's the idea of your soul and the goal. In Hinduism, there's also a very um, specific social class system that is built up around um, the religious beliefs. And in many of these early Bronze Age civilizations, we've seen that um, religion is used to justify um, a government, or it's used to justify social hierarchy, or religion is used to justify patriarchy. And in Hinduism, that is sort of amplified. Now, the caste system doesn't begin in the very complex way that it winds up, and it becomes over time much, much, much more strict. However, um, we're going to talk about the caste system in a pretty simplified way, just to make sure that we get the basics of it. But just know that it's an evolving system. It just doesn't pop up into being in its totally strict form and then stay that way. It slowly becomes that way. So um, within the caste system, a caste system just means a class system. Um, within the caste system, each group has a specific role or a dharma. You can think of these as your duties. And within your class, you are supposed to fulfill your duties very well. That is the goal of your life. And that's how you live a good life, is to fulfill the roles of your determined, predetermined class. How is it predetermined? You're born into it. Okay, so you get born into a class. Your class has a set of duties that, they're supposed to, that they are supposed to fulfill. And if you fulfill those, it means that you start uh, racking up good karma. Karma can kind of be thought of as the sum of your deeds, you know, weighing them in the balance, and hopefully they'll be on the, you know, good side. So if you, within your uh, caste, fulfill all of your dharma, get good karma, in your next reincarnation, uh, in that process of samsara, you'll be reincarnated up at a higher level than you were before. 
and you can kind of think of it almost as um, like finally popping out of the top, like a jack-in-the-box or something, right? You want to release yourself from that cycle of reincarnation, but in order to do that, you have to get all the way to the top of the social hierarchy. You have to reach the point of being a Brahmin before you can be released. And this is an interesting point because the caste system in India will in many ways be used to justify um, negative treatment of the bottom tiers of the, of the class system. Because the thought is, if you had behaved properly in your past lives, you wouldn't be at the bottom of the class structure, right? You would be up at the top of the class structure because you had performed all of your dharmas in your past life. So being born into one of those uh, lower rungs is almost viewed as um, a punishment for the sins of your past life, okay? Um, and this, of course, has some negative overtones. Um, it's just another way to justify um, bad behavior toward people at the lower end of the social spectrum. So we'll talk about that a little bit um, over the course of the year. Um, in addition to all the problems that people had um, with early Hinduism's huge focus on ritual, sacrifice, and only the very special Brahmin priestly class, um, and as it moved toward having more philosophical thoughts. There's also a move in Hinduism toward um, worship movements, and this is just called the Bhakti movement. Schreyer spoke about it. He basically said that um, it was in reaction to the Brahmins getting to do everything and the gods being viewed as quite impersonal, and the idea was that um, having devotion toward the gods could also um, count in your favor um, in your next cycle of reincarnation. All right. In addition to Brahman, I'd like you to know two other gods, specifically by name. Shiva and Vishnu need to at least be recognizable to you as part of the vast array of uh, Hindu gods and goddesses. Um, Shiva and Vishnu are two dudes who are gods, and they are incarnations of Brahman, but um, they're important enough that they're sort of um, way up at the top of the list in terms of the gods. Now, each of these two gods also have a huge variety of incarnations of themselves, and some of those incarnations have other incarnations. You can see that it's a, a huge there's going to be a huge array of different Hindu gods and goddesses. But again, they all kind of stem back to Brahman. Uh, they all go back to the old block, all of these gods and all of the people as well. All right, let's get a little bit uh, deeper into the Varna system and how it works within Hinduism. Um, every single society, as it grows in complexity, has to deal with how it will organize itself. And in India and within India, sorry, and in Hinduism, they're able to come up with a um, very effective system of organization. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, just, but it is effective. So um, up at the top of this social pyramid that we call the Varna system is the very top Varna. So each of these classes is called a Varna, but the very top is what we call the Brahmins. Brahmins is synonymous with, in English, priests. They're the people who perform the rituals. If they don't perform the rituals and sacrifices properly, the whole universe goes out of kilter. Again, they're extremely important. Brahmins gain a lot of social status because, of course, if you're at the very top of the social hierarchy in your past lives, you must have been doing really awesome stuff, fulfilling all your dharma. So they have a lot of uh, power and status and usually wealth. The group below the Brahmins are called the Kshatriyas. Kshatriyas are warriors, that's the English term, and Kshatriyas have um, a very, very high social status as well, although not quite as high as the Brahmins. Vaishas you can think of as artisans, anybody who makes stuff for a living, whether you, I don't know, um, inlay gold leaf onto temple doors, or make baskets, or pottery, or um, shoe horses, whatever it is that you do, if it is 
artisan work than Yuravaisha. And at the bottom of the Varna system are Shudras. And this is, of course, the majority of the population. And they are your peasant farmers. I've got the um, English terms over there on the right-hand side of um, the PowerPoint. So um, you'll need to know the names of these groups and what those words mean in English. This whole system is justified um, in a very early portion of the Vedas, the Rig Veda. Um, there's a story of the god Purusha, and Purusha, um, out of his head come the Brahmins, and his arms are the Kshatriya, his legs are the Vaishya, and his feet are the Shudra. It's a creation story about the creation of the universe and the creation of humans. And that religious justification is there because the Varna system is so effective in terms of a way to organize societies. It gains complexity and as the population increases. Um, every single job that must get done in a society is going to get done in this Varna system. Um, and each group, because of that religious backing, that um, feeling that you need to fulfill your dharma, your caste's dharma, in order to move up through the process of samsara and reincarnation. Because of that pressure, you can imagine that all the people within this group in general are going to kind of buy into the system and fulfill their duties. Now, Strayer does discuss um, social mobility within Hinduism. It is limited, but it is still possible. So I'll reiterate that, and I'd like you to write it on your notes out to the side. Um, social mobility is limited, but possible in Hinduism. Social mobility is limited, but possible in Hinduism. Pretty much the way um, Strayer describes it, if you'll remember from your reading, is that each of these uh, varnas is subdivided into about a quadrillion different jati. A jati just kind of means a job. So within the shudras, there's the basket maker jati. Um, oh, I'm sorry, within the vaishas, there's the basket maker jati and the pottery maker jati. Um, within the shudras, there are the people who herd goats and the people who grow rice, okay? And um, these are obviously fake jati. I don't know if those jati actually exist. So what happens um, according to Schreer, is that over the course of time, it's possible to um, have your jati gain in status within the varna that you are. Okay, So you can't leap from being a Vaisha to being a Kshatriya, but you can move from being like a low-ranked jati to being a high-ranked jati within the Vaisha group or whatever. Um, this isn't an individual enterprise. This is a group enterprise. So say um, you as a Shudra farmer have like, you know, two really productive generations of farming. And by the time your grandkids are born, um, your jati has risen up to the top of the Shudra caste. That's a way to achieve social mobility within Hinduism. It is a lot more limited than what we see in some other parts of the world. But again, um, Part of that is because the Varna system is so effective at organizing society and make sure, making sure that all the components that need to get done actually get done. So, all right. There is a group that does not have caste. It doesn't have a caste at all. This is known in English as um, the untouchables. Um, this group is really outside of the caste system because they're prescribed roles in society are um, jobs which would make a person, according to the religion, ritually unclean. And that means that pretty much they deal with um, bodily fluids in a lot of religion. I don't, I'm not quite sure why, but in a lot of religions, um, bodily fluids are unclean. So blood, um, tears, spit, anything like that is an unclean substance. And if you're an untouchable, usually what you're doing is dealing with some sort of job that would make you come into contact with bodily fluids. It makes you unclean and none of the rest of the Varnas, uh, or none of the Varnas, since you don't have a Varna, none of the Varnas are allowed to have contact with you. 
Um, an example of an untouchable job would be um, equivalent to an undertaker, so someone who deals with dead bodies. Dead bodies in Hinduism are ritually unclean. If you touch them, you're unclean. So untouchables cannot associate with any of the varnas because they are doing a job that's ritually unclean. It does in, um, in South Asia um, result in very low levels of slavery. However, um, when you have a whole class of people who are in charge of sort of that uh, menial labor that no one else really wants to do, there's no need to have a slave class because all those jobs are getting done anyway. And we'll see that's very different in some of our other later societies. Uh, for example, um, Rome, an Iron Age empire, we'll study very soon, uh, has up to a third of its population at any given time um, bought and purchased into slavery so that those kinds of jobs get done. All right, um, I think I pretty much went over all of this. Uh, the Varna system is justified by religion. You can move up by performing your Varna's Dharma well, but you can't move up in this life. You have to move up in the next life. The only way to achieve social mobility is just within your jati or your job, and it can only move within the caste that you were actually born into. You can't jump castes within a lifetime. Um, all of this very rigid social hierarchy is critiqued in a new religion that appears in India in around 500 BCE called Buddhism. We'll be discussing Buddhism more later, but I do really want you to keep in your brain the idea that Buddhism is a direct critique of Hinduism. And go ahead and star that third bullet point on your guided notes. Buddhism is a direct critique of Hinduism. Um, it views the caste system, I think, pretty much as unjust. And what the Buddha teaches instead is that any person at any point in their life can actually attain enlightenment, um, which in Hinduism, again, is called moksha, but in Buddhism, we usually call it um, enlightenment. So Buddhism has a very different teaching there, and you can see why to be attractive to people. Um, especially people within those lower castes or within the untouchable class of people um, because they would have a chance to have a better social standing if they converted to Buddhism, which doesn't have that caste system within it. Now, it is also critical to remember that Buddhism and Hinduism um, appear in the same place and there's a lot of interaction and interchange between the two. Um, the term moksha and enlightenment is a great example of that. The idea that the soul is reincarnated over a period of, um, a, you know, any number of lifetimes is an important thing to remember. The idea that your soul uh, has its, you know, a goal of um, being released from that cycle of reincarnation is, in, is uh, something that Buddhism draws directly from Hinduism. All right, we're going to leave Hinduism for a little while and talk about Zoroastrianism. Um, I just have one slide about it. It's quite short. There are a couple hundred thousand Zoroastrians left in the world today. However, the ideas of the religion have a huge impact on the rest of history. So, um, we haven't talked about the Persian Empire yet, but we will very soon. Um, Zoroastrianism becomes the official religion of Persia. Um, it's founded by a guy named Zoroaster. Obviously, the picture on, on the right is, you know, not really him. We're not sure what he looked like. But he created a religion that was very unique in that it was definitely monotheistic. Um, Ahura Mazda was the main, uh, or the god, uh, of Zoroastrianism. And uh, Zoroaster, when he uh, went around, you know, preaching his new religion had a lot of really interesting ideas that should sound extremely familiar to you, um, including a belief in heaven and hell, uh, the idea of um, a final judgment day when God will um, judge, you know, the righteousness of people's souls, um, and especially the dualistic nature of the universe. I realize that word might be a little bit funny, but dualistic just means there are sort of two opposing sides or 
two ideas about how the universe looks. Um, and in this case, the idea in Zoroastrianism is that there is good in the universe represented by Ahura Mazda, and there's evil in the universe. And we would usually in, you know, our culture associate that with Satan um, and Zoroastrianism. The bad guy is called um, Ahriman, but it's that same concept. And there's also the concept of um, there, you know, appearing a savior, a messiah. The important part of Zoroastrianism is that those ideas of monotheism, heaven and hell, judgment day, and good versus evil are assimilated into other monotheistic faiths in the area conquered by the Persian Empire, including the area that the next group called the Hebrews lived in. And you'll see that Zoroastrianism is going to have a really big impact on the development of Judaism and its theology as well. So Judaism, we're going to talk about it briefly as well. Um, Judaism develops um, in an area right along the Mediterranean Sea, um, sort of to the left of Mesopotamia, if you can remember where that was on your map. Um, the Hebrews started out as a pastoralist group, um, herding uh, animals, and then later they settled down. They do create um, a very small empire and a state, so they begin farming and settling down. Now, as they develop their unique religion and practice their unique religion, um, they begin to develop a series of laws that keep them as a monotheistic believing people separate from all the different polytheists around them. And eventually the Hebrews are conquered by other groups um, that uh, take over various parts of Mesopotamia and the Middle East. But um, despite being conquered on several different occasions and exiled on several different occasions, um, Jews have been able to retain their culture and their religion and their um, religious practices intact, um, at least to a certain extent, down to the present day. And a lot of that, we think, comes from the very, very particular laws that Jews are required to follow. Um, most of them are found in the book of Deuteronomy, although not exclusively. Um, we refer to this as the Deuteronomic Code. Um, if you open a book, a Bible, um, and look in Deuteronomy, you will just see a bunch of kind of uh, a little bit esoteric laws listed there. Um, and again, this isn't, or at least from a historical perspective, most of those laws are about um, preventing um, the Hebrews from becoming too similar to the people who lived around them. Um, because all the people around them were polytheists, Jews were monotheists, if all of their practices and the way that they lived their life was extremely different, then there probably wouldn't be a lot of mingling between those populations, and um, the Jewish population would be able to retain their beliefs and their values. Um, the ideas of Judaism have a lot in common with Zoroastrianism. Um, that very rigorous monotheism is part of it. Um, Yahweh, or the God of the Old Testament, um, is a pretty unique figure for Bronze Age religions um, because he's viewed as being very actively involved and concerned with and interested in human affairs. And um, he's particularly interested in the um, activities of um, the Hebrew people. And there are, there's a point in Genesis, um, you might know the story, um, when Abraham uh, is told to leave his tent um, and go out into the night uh, by God. And God has him look at all the stars and he says, um, pretty much, worship me and you will have a lot of ancestors you'll have a lot of children and great-grandchildren and great-great-great-grandchildren and they'll worship me and I'll be their God. And um, you'll have a lot of ancestors and um, you'll be my people and I'll be your God. And it's almost like a little bargain or um, in more religious language, it's called a covenant. 
Judaism is very important because it is the basis of, in addition to, um, you know, its own importance as a religion, it's also the basis for Christianity and Islam. The ideas are of Judaism are um, in many ways lifted directly from Judaism. And without Judaism, you really don't have either Christianity or Islam. And since Christianity and Islam are the two predominant religions in the world today, uh, Judaism has a, poor, uh, a position of prominence. Um, and we need to understand the importance of monotheism and the importance of those laws that prevented the monotheistic Jewish population from assimilating into the populations that surrounded them in Mesopotamia. All right. Briefly, we're going to take a look at Chinese philosophies. And we've got three to go through, but they're pretty basic, I think, and understandable. Um, they all come out of a very particular time period in Chinese history called the Warring States period. And it should be no surprise that the Warring States period had a lot of war in it. Um, the Zhou Dynasty, which is the second of the Chinese dynasties that we'll talk about this year, fell apart. And um, in the chaos that ensued, different um, philosophers tried to think about a way that they could reorganize society to create harmony and make things better. The first of these philosophers was Confucius. Um, he was around in about 500 BCE, and he acts as an advisor to rulers during the Warring States period. Um, he's a little bit frustrated in life because people don't listen to him very much, but um, after his death, his followers, his disciples, write down his ideas, and um, Confucian philosophy is hugely influential still today within China. Um, it provides about 2,500 years of continuity in terms of Chinese civilization in the way people view society and how it should be ordered. There are a couple big ideas that we need to know. The first two um, are the ideas of Ren and Zhao. Ren is what people in the top of the social hierarchy are supposed to give to people in the lower portion of the social hierarchy. Ren is basically benevolence or justice or kindness. Um, people at the top of the social hierarchy are supposed to behave righteously and they're supposed to act righteously toward the people um, beneath them. The people at the bottom of the social hierarchy are supposed to give back Zhao to the people at the top of the social hierarchy. Zhao sometimes gets translated as filial piety, and everybody go ahead and put a star beside those words, filial piety. Um, pretty much that just means respect. As a person in a subordinate position, you are supposed to respect, aka obey, the people in the position of authority over you. So those people are supposed to give you Ren, benevolence and justice. You're supposed to give them Zhao, respect and um, obedience. Now, there are a couple different relationships that um, help you understand where you are in that social hierarchy, whether you're at the top of it or at the bottom of it. Um, ruler subject, father, son, husband, wife, elder, younger. And if you, um, Think about these relationships and where you are within that social hierarchy, you'll know how to behave. So a husband is supposed to behave righteously. He's supposed to give off lots of ren or benevolence and justice to his wife. And the wife is in the subordinate position, according to Confucianism, and is supposed to return respect and obedience. So if you know your status, your age, and your gender, you will know how to behave in any situation. It's a perfect solution to the Warring States period problem of chaos and social disharmony. Now, Confucius' ideas are all written down in a book called The Analects. It's not written by Confucius himself. It's written by his followers. But again, the goal is all about harmony and how one can achieve a harmonious society and an effective government. Um, 
Government should behave in much the same way as society. People at the top of the government's social hierarchy, aka the emperor, should behave with justice and benevolence, and all of the subjects, those people in subordinate positions, should behave with zhao, or respect, obedience, and filial piety. Um, Confucianism assumes that people are good, or at least correctable, even if they're not behaving well, if they had a good example to follow, then they would mend their ways. The emperor in Confucianism is the prime example of this. The emperor is supposed to be the embodiment of everything that is perfect, and um, he's supposed to do all of the rituals correctly, he's supposed to honor his ancestors correctly, and when he does those things, the subjects, the people in the subordinate position to him, are supposed to naturally follow. I think that it's Strayer that has the analogy of the wind, and uh, the emperors like the wind, or the people in the higher positions are like the wind, and they blow, and all the grass bends, and goes in the direction of um, behaving properly as well. Um, a lot of stuff that's in these old Chinese philosophy books sounds kind of like Yoda is talking. So here's a few funny ones. I really like that last one. The superior man blames himself. The inferior man blames others. So if you come in without your homework and you try to blame your dog, you're being the inferior man, right? You know, take responsibility. It's, it's a good thing. All right, let's talk about legalism. Super easy to understand. Legalism is like laying the smack down on people. So Han Fei is the originator of legalism. He has a different way of um, restoring order to China, and that is to like, basically um, lay the law down and then harshly punish people who don't follow it. Um, legalism becomes the official political philosophy of the Qin Dynasty. I hope that you can hear the term China in the word Qin. The Qin Dynasty is the very first dynasty to reunify China after the Warring States period. You can tell that legalism is probably the kind of political philosophy that they'd want to go with, because if you're reunifying something that's in complete chaos and war, you're going to kind of need to use something pretty harsh to get people back in line. The idea is that Unlike in Confucianism, where human nature is good, human nature, according to legalism, is um, bad. So Confucianism, human nature is okay, it's correctable, and legalism is selfish and bad. And we need, if we're going to behave morally, to have very strict laws, and those laws should be enforced by a very strong ruler. All right, this system is very authoritarian, meaning that um, individuals and their rights are not terribly important. The important thing is to obey and follow a powerful authority or ruler who is able to keep order. So, um, and again, it's understandable why this was a popular idea, especially during the Qin Dynasty. Um, freedom isn't worth much if the society is in complete chaos. So people viewed um, order and stability as a higher priority than they did individual freedoms. Taoism is basically the complete opposite. You can think of Taoism or Taoists as ancient hippies um, uh, and slash Yoda as well. Um, they try to find the way of nature. Um, this is supposed to be a picture of Lao Tzu, the founder. We have no idea what Lao Tzu actually looked like. However, um, we definitely know that he was a hippie, so my guess is he was wearing Birkenstocks and maybe like a Hawaiian shirt. So, um, Lao Tzu's goal was to stop trying so hard and in ceasing to try so hard to find peace. Um, he wrote a book called the Tao Te Ching, which is the classic in the way and its power, right? It's a pretty cool title. Um, he says great things in it, like those who speak know nothing. Those who know are silent. Ooh. Okay. Um, Taoist principles include the idea of the Tao, or the way. Uh, you can think of it as the force in Star Wars, right? You know, when uh, the like Yoda 
is like, oh, Luke Skywalker, you know, use the force, feel the force, have the power of nature in your hands. Okay, it's exactly the same. Um, nature is imbued with this m magical force, and it's your job to stop fighting against it and just let it kind of wash over you. Um, your goal is to become one with it, become one with nature and the universe. You can kind of imagine hippies like running off into the woods to like live in little cabins by lakes, kind of like Thoreau and Walden Pond or something like that. Um, there is a specific term used for the way that one is supposed to learn how to harness the force or um, become one with the force or the Tao, I suppose I should say. And that's called Wu Wei. Wu Wei just means to go with the flow. So you just got to Wu Wei on, relax, it's all good, calm down, stop trying to make laws and like, you know, um, do everything right, just run out in the woods and go with the flow, get in touch with nature. Um, Lao Tzu says that humans are unhappy because they follow all these man-made laws and they're not just letting the Wu Wei happen, they should just go with the flow. Discover the rhythm of the universe. Um, form a drum circle. I don't know. Okay. Um, ignore political and social laws. Taoism is also very excited about the idea of balance, and the yin and yang symbol comes out of Taoism. We don't really go into the details of it. Um, so, in the end, there are three solutions to the chaos that existed in China during the Warring States period. The first solution is Confucianism. How can, I, how can we get harmony? Let's um, make everybody moral by having proper relationships. These superiors will exhibit a huge amount of ren and benevolence. The inferiors will exhibit a huge amount of zhao or uh, obedience and respect. In legalism, we're just going to lay the smack down. And in Taoism, we're going to run out into nature and be hippies. So those are your three ideas. Make sure that you've got your guided notes filled out and your graphic organizer for the Chinese philosophies filled out. And um, if you have any questions, please um, bring them with you to class so that we can clarify any issues that you had with this lecture.